Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Apostle Curtis Schultz, and I'm here again to do another video on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, um, the meaning of the gospel, the importance of this gospel, its power, um, how the gospel works, how it will never work. So we've been doing a series of videos on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, we've been working our way to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, a couple of videos back, we started talking about Galatians chapter 1, 6 and 7. We went into Galatians chapter 3, 1 through 5. And so we're working our way toward Galatians chapter 5, verse verses 16 through 25. Now, what I want to do today as a simple backdrop or as a simple background to these 10 verses in Galatians 5, 16 through 25, is I'm going to do a brief commentary or just share a few things um, in the first 12 verses of this chapter. Now, before we get started, I would just like to remind you that uh, we have three books out right now. Uh, it's a three-book series called Evangel. Uh, three-book series called Evangel. The first book is Evangel, Redemption in Christ. That's the first book. The second book, again, is Evangel, Believer Sanctification. And the third book is Evangel, Justification by Faith. Now, these three books, again, a three-book series on the gospel. The word evangel means the gospel. And so, in the things that we're sharing today, and the things that we have shared, and the things that we'll share into the future concerning this gospel, we put into print. So I want to encourage you to check these books out, to put them on your library, put them in your library as reference material. Uh, very helpful information. I put it in print to support the videos. I'm doing the videos to support what I put in print. Okay. You can get the books on Amazon. You can get it Barnes and Noble. It's also on Kindle. And you can find it either under its title name, Evangel, uh, Justification by Faith, or Believer Sanctification, or Redemption in Christ, the subtitle, subheading. Or you can simply look up, look it up under my name, uh, Curtis L. Schultz. That's Curtis, C-U-R-T-I-S, L, last name, S-C-H-U-L-Z-E. Again, I just encourage you to get these books. Um, you'll find them very challenging and very informative, very helpful. Again, we're going to go ahead and take a look at Galatians chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 12. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to say about Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 12 Go home or uh, after this video, take some time out and go ahead and just read those first 12 verses. And what you'll find that the first 12 verses is kind of a backdrop or a background in preparation for the second half of the chapter. Actually, Paul wrote these first 12 verses, if you will, in anticipation of the verses he was about to write in Galatians 5, 16 through 25. So it's important to understand some very key points or principles found in Galatians 5, 1 through 12. We'll look at a few of them as kind of a backdrop or as kind of a preparation for the things that Paul is about to say or wants to write, the things he wants to say, in Galatians 5, 16 through 25. Again, he wrote Galatians 5, 1 through 12 
in anticipation of uh, Galatians 5, 16 through 25. So 1 through 12 is kind of a backdrop for 16 to 25. Now, what I want to draw your attention to here is um, the first verse in Galatians 5.1. Now listen to it very carefully. All right. Paul says in verse 1 of Galatians 5, Paul says that we're to stand fast. We're to stand fast. Now, what Paul's going to do in these first 12 verses of Galatians 5 is give us a simple recap of everything he already has written in the first four chapters, especially chapters one and chapters three. So what we're gonna draw out of the text, I'm gonna show you in these first 12 verses where Paul is doing a simple recap on things he's already written in the first four chapters, especially chapter one and chapter three, as kind of a background for what he's about to write in Galatians 5, 16 to 25. Now, what we find in Galatians 5, 16 to 25, we're going to, find, we're going to find Paul presenting the gospel. He's going to present the gospel uh, in our Christian sanctification. So what we find in Galatians 5, 16 to 25, we find uh, Paul presenting his gospel to the believer's sanctification, our Christian sanctification. So it's important to understand the perspective or point of view Paul is coming from first before he writes about our Christian sanctification. That way we can properly interpret, understand and interpret and apply what Paul is writing in the text of Galatians 5, 16 to 25, our Christian sanctification. Now, again, in verse 1 of Galatians 5, Paul tells us to stand fast. Now, remember, the reason why he's telling them to stand fast is because Judaizers had come into Galatia, had come into the churches in Galatia, and began to pervert the gospel or corrupt the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what Paul is saying here in the text is he's telling the Galatian believers here to hold their ground against these false teachings. So to stand fast means Paul is saying, hold your ground against them. Hold your ground against false teaching. Hold your ground against against these Judaizers, these false uh, preachers. Hold your ground against it. Now, or hold your ground against those things being added to the gospel. Now, remember what we said, that um, in the writing of the epistle here to the Galatians, Paul was giving his defense of the gospel. He was defending his gospel against Judaizers, against those Jewish Christians coming from Jerusalem into Galatia, undermining his work, uh, uh, undermining his apostleship, and undermining his gospel. And so Paul is writing this epistle to the Galatians in both defense of his gospel against these Judaizers and even against some believers at Galatia who begin to side with this false gospel and these Judaizers. So again, Paul is giving a defense of his gospel, okay, a defense against those things being added to the gospel. Now, we know the historical setting or context of the book itself is uh, these Jewish Christians came in and began to preach Moses or began to add Moses to the gospel or began to mingle law with grace, mix law with grace. So we understand in the historical setting of the epistle, we understand Paul is directly confronting uh, those that wanted to add Moses to the gospel or begin to mix 
law or the Mosaic code or uh, the, the, the laws of the Old Testament with the New Testament gospel. So that's the historical setting. But that's the specific application here in the text or in the epistle. But it's important to understand that not only is there a specific application or a specific setting or a specific uh, uh, historical setting, uh, there's also a general application in the text. Now, what that means is because the book of Galatians is a living epistle, that means the book and its message has to apply to us today. It has to speak to us today, not just in its past historical setting. So it's not enough just to understand the epistle from the historical setting, its past setting. It's important that there's a present application, even a present interpretation and application of the material to our present day experience, what we're going through presently in the church. Now, it's important to understand that for the most part, the church does not struggle with Moses and the keeping of the law anymore. Now, some circles do. Some today are trying to bring back Moses and the law. Um, I understand how uh, there's a lot to be gained by learning about uh, the Jewish roots of the Bible. I think there's a lot to learn, a lot to be gained by learning about our Jewish roots, the Jewish roots of the scripture, or even the Jewish beginning of the gospel, the Jewish beginning of the gospel, or the Jewish roots of the scripture. But I don't have any Jewish roots. I'm a Gentile believer. Uh, according to the Pauline gospel, as an apostle to the Gentiles, he never mixed Moses with the gospel. He never mixed law with grace. So that means as a Gentile Christian, I don't have any Jewish roots. As, a, as an individual believer, as a Christian, I don't have Jewish roots. Now, the scriptures do uh, have Jewish roots, and the gospel itself did have a Jewish background or a Jewish beginning. That's true. Very true. So there's a lot to be learned from uh, the Jewish roots of the scripture or even the Jewish background of the commencement of the gospel. Yes, and I can learn about that, but I'm not trying to bring, I'm not trying to mix Judaism in with Christianity. I'm not trying to mix the Jewish faith in with the Christian faith. I'm not trying to mix uh, Moses into the gospel or mingle law with grace. I'm not trying to do that, but there's a lot to be gained by learning about these things without trying to participate in these things or make these things a part of our everyday practice. So there's a big difference between coming into the knowledge of something and understanding that knowledge in its old context and now how it should be understood in its new context versus you and I um, beginning to go back to things in the past and beginning to bring it into our present and begin to participate in the present in those things from the past. So it's very important that we're careful not to bring Moses into the gospel or begin to mingle law with grace. That is imperative. That is important. We don't want to do that. So, um, but I know that today there is a major Jewish roots movement. Uh, the shofar, the prayer cloth, you know, the prayer shawl, uh, um, some observing Seder supper, some participating in the Passover meal, Seder supper, Passover meal during the Passover, um, some of these traditions. I don't see a problem with some of these things in general. Nothing wrong with blowing the shafar or wearing a prayer shawl. Um, nothing wrong with participating in a Seder supper, which is uh, which is uh, remembering the Passover. Um, I don't see any problem as long as we don't make these things required participation or required practice 
for our Christian sanctification. It adds nothing to our Christian sanctification. It adds nothing to the gospel. That's the point. There's a lot of things that we can do in our tradition, or there's a lot of things that we can practice or put into practice that becomes tradition that simply uh, are things that we do to remember the meaning of the gospel or to remember um, what, uh, what Christ did in his death, burial, resurrection. So there's a lot of things that we can do or put into practice, even create as a tradition that kind of reminds us of things as long as the tradition, as Jesus said, as long as your traditions doesn't uh, make void the commandments. As long as these things that we put into practice that we call traditions doesn't take away from the gospel or add to the gospel where men look away from the gospel and men are now hindered in the gospel. Now, I know there's a fine line in these things. So I do think it's very important to be very careful. I know the church is very replete with religious traditions and religious systems. I know they are. And believe it or not, they are really more harmful than good. They actually work to distract more than they help assist one in the faith. They really do because people have a tendency to trust in their systems or traditions than in the actual word of promise or in the actual gospel itself, what God has said and what that means uh, in the thing that God has done in Christ Jesus for our deliverance, our freedom, our healing, uh, uh, power, victory, um, uh, the full victory, the abundant life, all these things. So that's why I don't like systems and traditions and rituals. I don't like anything that becomes a distraction, but in and of themselves, they're not necessarily wrong. See, so you have to be very careful. Uh, I don't want to make a tradition out of being very non-traditional. I don't want to make a tradition out of being against all traditions. But I do want to be very careful that if I do have a tradition, that I'm careful not to let that, that tradition become a distraction is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so, um, so the specific historical setting here in Galatians is when these Jewish Christians came these Jews that became believers in their Jewish Messiah came into Galatia and attempted to add Moses to the gospel or attempted to mix the laws of Moses with the grace of Christ. And Paul was vehemently against this. Paul saw that as taking away from the gospel itself by adding something to it. In other words, by adding something to the gospel you were actually saying the gospel wasn't enough. The gospel was not sufficient in and of itself to save, to sanctify, and to ultimately bring us into glorification, which is the completion of that redemptive process, which is the resurrection of the body into eternal life. So I just want to be very careful that I find a middle ground I'm not against traditions. I'm not against uh, the religious systems of men. I'm not against them. Uh, but I know how much they do uh, get in the way of the gospel. The gospel is a power. The gospel is a provision in Christ for the overcoming Christian life. And in that gospel, God has provided not only the forgiveness of sins, and new life in Christ has imparted new life, a resurrected life, a spiritual regeneration. Uh, it has also delivered us from the power of sin, has set us free, has emancipated, liberated us from uh, the power of sin and death. Uh, we've been, we've been um, healed from the effects of those things and the damage that occurred as a result of being under sin, 
uh, in the world under sin. Also, um, it provides the gospels of power and provision that protects us, preserves us, keeps us, and causes us to come into fullness or wholeness, spirit, soul, body, uh, until we receive the full redemption of the purchased possession or we receive the full redemption of what Christ has purchased for us, we being his purchased redemption. So I just want to be very careful that um, the things that we um, practice, such as traditions, or if we have a particular denominational church system, uh, a, a belief system, uh, certain practices or disciplines, again, traditions, any of these things in and of themselves are harmless as long as the attitude toward them, our understanding of those things, how we participate in them, uh, doesn't take away from our our allegiance and focus on the gospel alone to save, sanctify, and glorify. Does that make sense? I'm, 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 the, the general principle here in this epistle of Galatians is uh, Paul was coming against anything being added to the gospel. See? So, um, while specifically it was adding Moses to the gospel or adding or mingling law with grace, today, what we have to understand uh, as a general principle or as a general rule of thumb where it concerns interpreting and applying the epistle to the Galatians today in our present experience, in our present faith, it is Paul was rebuking or challenging or confronting or coming against anything being added to the gospel today. It may not be Moses. It may not be the laws of, of Moses, the Ten Commandments or the Mosaic Code, the Old Testament, um, the Old Testament rules and principles, but it could be a so-called religious Christian tradition or system, some ritual discipline, some code of conduct, some set of rules. There's there there are many denominational rules, sets of rules um, that have been put in place by different denominations, a dress code, a code of conduct, um, uh, an order of service, these kinds of things, the way we do things, and we have a tendency to lock people in a box, and in the fact that we lock people in a box, we're actually locking the gospel in a box, and we don't realize that through our different various religious systems and traditions of men. That's all I'm saying. So, some denominations are more guilty of this. Uh, they're very traditional. They're very locked into a box, a very, very strong and hard and, 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 and uh, uh, liturgical box. You know, they're locked into a liturgical box and they can't look outside that box. And they're, so they're boxing themselves uh, out of the gospel. Uh, even if that box they created, that religious system, that box they created was built off the Bible and built off the gospel, they're no longer looking at the actual gospel. They're now only looking at the box or the system they created from the Bible or from the gospel. Does that make sense? So there's no doubt that uh, all, of, all three branches of Christendom, Roman Catholic, the Orthodox faith, Protestantism, all three branches of Christendom have their own uh, traditions, their own religious systems. And uh, for the most part, they don't have to be harmful. But for the most part, they do end up being very distracting and diverting our attention away from looking at the gospel alone and understanding its meaning, understanding its provision, understanding how faith works how this gospel works and how the Holy Spirit is right there waiting to show you what he can do when you finally understand and believe what the gospel has already done. 
and you place your faith in what the gospel has already done and believe, and the Holy Ghost go, works to perform and to bring forth the promised result of what the gospel has provided. So it's very important that, um, that we understand that what the book of Galatians really is all about, it is really all about the defense of the gospel, this simple yet powerful, profound gospel of Jesus Christ and the provision God has made in Christ Jesus through his death, burial, resurrection that has provided for your victory as an overcoming Christian, has provided for the forgiveness of sins, the importation of new life, the promise of eternal life, the promise of the resurrection of the body uh, at the last day upon the return of Jesus Christ, and also the gospel as a power, as a provision for in our Christian sanctification, uh, the victorious Christian life and overcoming life, victory over sin, victory over uh, sicknesses and diseases, victory over poverty, death, the whole curse, victory over devils, demons, of the elements, nature, victory over every circumstance and situation of life is found in this simple principle, simple promise, simple provision of the gospel of Jesus Christ found in his redemptive work on that cross through his death, burial, resurrection, and our faith in it and our identification with Christ in that death, his death is ours, in his burial as ours, in his resurrection, now our resurrection, or our spiritual regeneration to new life. Romans 6, 1 through 14, um, is the gospel in our sanctification, in power, and um, what we're going to see in a future video which is probably the next couple, next two or three videos that we're going to do. When we look into Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25, we're going to actually see where Paul is addressing uh, our Christian sanctification. And there's some powerful stuff that Paul has uh, revealed in those 10 verses. In the second half of Galatians chapter 5, you don't want to miss but what we want to do in these first 12 verses, we're just going to look at a few verses and simply explain a few things in these verses to help set the background or the backdrop um, to Galatians 5, 16 through 25. That's what we want to do. So again, what we saw in the first verse of Galatians 5, verse 1, Paul said to stand fast. Now, we need to hold, we need to, we, it's important that we hold our ground against um, those that would want to add to the gospel and distract our attention or divert our attention away from the full provision that God has made for us in this gospel, which is your simple baptism, your simple baptism into Christ's death, burial, resurrection. Um, the Bible is very clear. The power is in your simple baptism. The power. Now, now let me let me share this first. If you look at Galatians chapter two, verse five, you will see where Paul uh, speaks of the need for you and I to continue in the truth of the gospel, the truth of the gospel. Then you'll see in Galatians 2.20, where Paul explained that gospel to be, you and I now crucified with Christ. And then you'll see that what he calls the gospel in Galatians 2.5, and what he calls you and I being crucified with Christ in Galatians 2.20, he calls the believers baptism into Jesus Christ, where we actually put on Christ. We put on his death. We put on his burial. 
We put on his resurrection as our own. We see this in Galatians 3, 27. So you can see in Paul's epistle to the Galatians, where Paul, when he speaks of the gospel, he explains the gospel as you and I being crucified with Jesus Christ, and then he calls that the believer's baptism in Galatians 3.27, as you and I being baptized into Jesus Christ, where we put on Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, right? And then you'll see, I believe it's in Galatians uh, 6.14 or 6.15, where Paul calls this the new creation. It's not circumcision that avails anyone. It's not those things being added. It's not Moses. Um, what avails or prevails in the life of any believer is the new creation. The new creation has come into our life. We become a new creation as a result of being baptized into Jesus Christ, into his death, burial, resurrection, where we've now put on Christ. We've now put on that death, put on that burial, put on that resurrection, where we've been identified with him in these things, and we identify with him in those things in us. It's very important that the power and provision that God has made for us in this victorious Christian living, our Christian sanctification, it must be understood in simple faith and confidence in the gospel alone, in our simple baptism where we've been put into Jesus Christ and have put him on put on what is his. So we need to hold fast or stand fast or hold our ground against those who would add anything to the gospel, whether a religious system or tradition of men, commandments and doctrines of men, a spiritual ritual or discipline, a ritual discipline. It doesn't matter what it is, a belief system, a doctrine. I don't care what it is. Adding anything that causes our attention to be diverted away from looking at the gospel alone and what the gospel has provided for us in our simple baptism into Jesus Christ where we put on him and all that is his, all that belongs to him, and now we can bear its fruit and work its, work, work its works and manifest its promised result. This is imperative. This is why, while... I'm not necessarily against any man's religious tradition. I'm not necessarily against any man's religious. I love the church. I love the church. I love my Catholic brethren. I love my uh, Orthodox brethren. I love my Protestant brethren. I love my Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, Reformed tradition, uh, the Church of God in Christ. Um, I, I, Pentecostal, I, lo I love all of my Christian brethren. Uh, I don't allow the different religious traditions or so-called Christian systems of men that have made these denominations or have made these distinctions within Christendom, uh, these distinctions of this sect or this party or this group and that group. Uh, I don't allow those things to affect my love for you. My only concern really is how those boxes, those religious boxes we put ourselves in called being a Baptist or those religious boxes we put ourselves in called Anglican or Episcopal or those religious systems that we put ourselves in called Roman Catholicism or the Orthodox faith uh, uh, or Protestantism, these different religious traditions and systems of men that we put ourselves in, the boxes we put ourselves in, I'm only concerned that they will keep us from the gospel, they will hinder the gospel, hinder the gospel in our eyes, in our heart, in our faith, in our understanding. If that happens, then we fall from grace. Some of us fall away from grace entirely. Others simply just frustrate the grace. And because of that, we're hindered in our Christian sanctification. We're hindered in our spiritual growth. 
were hindered in coming into that promised Christian victory of the overcoming Christian life. So I think that's probably my big concern. That's probably my big concern. So um, I'm just trying to giving give just trying to give you a little bit of a backdrop on this of the epistle where what Paul's dealing with here is really things being added to the gospel. Now, it says in verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So, Paul here in the first text tells us it's important that we hold the freedom. It is important that we continue in the freedom the gospel has provided in Christ Jesus. Um, to add anything to the gospel can take away from that freedom or divert or distract from that liberty. Actually, the things being added to the gospel here in the text, Paul calls a yoke of bondage. Anything or everything, no matter how small it might be, it could it could vary from just a small few simple things being added to the extreme of asceticism, very harsh, uh, harsh exterior, uh, outward constraint, a very harsh discipline to the body, uh, discipline to our, uh, our natural lives, uh, a set of rules, a set of do's and don'ts, things we cannot do, allowed to do, very harsh discipline, harsh lifestyle of legalism, uh, things added to the simple uh, Christian faith, the gospel, or it could just be um, one simple tradition or one simple way of believing something that actually doesn't agree with the gospel, something added that takes away from the power and provision provided for us in that gospel, through faith in that gospel. Now, so... I want you to see that what Paul is what Paul is addressing is simple. Uh, um, we've all of us, whether we're Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, I don't care what our affiliation is, denomination, our background, uh, what we were raised in, our tradition. Um, I don't care about any of that. Um, Paul is telling us we've all received the same one gospel, the same one Lord, Jesus Christ, who's come into our life through the person of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit resides in us as the presence of God and the source of power to make this gospel real in our lives, to manifest its promised result. The problem is, the warning that Paul is giving in Galatians is the gospel will not work for you if you don't work the gospel alone, the way it's supposed to be worked. And the Holy Ghost is there. He's the power ready to work this gospel and manifest its promised result, but he will not work in your life. The Holy Spirit is your sanctifier and perfecter. He's the one that works in your Christian sanctification. And we work, when he works, we work in cooperation with his work. And if he's not working, we can't work. That means all the works we do that's apart from his work or outside of his working means dead works. It means it won't work. There's no power in it, no provision of God in it. And we'll find ourselves stumbling and struggling, living defeated lives, struggling with sinning in our body. You know, we'll struggle with faith. We'll struggle with all of those things simply promised in the word of God to us, for us, as believers, as Christians, we will struggle with the simple things of the faith because the Holy Spirit is not working because we're not standing on, believing in, and laboring from the gospel alone. We're actually laboring from our traditions. Do you remember in the Old Testament where um, God gave the Jews the, the commandments, the laws, called the Laws of Moses, the three divisions of the law, the three branches of the Mosaic Code, 
the ceremonial, the civil, the moral code, the moral code of the Ten Commandments, the ceremonial law of the priesthood, the tabernacle, the animal sacrifices, the entire Old Testament redemptive economy. And then, of course, the civil law of all those laws given in Moses or by Moses, which told them how to treat their neighbor, how to, how to walk with their neighbor, how to live with their neighbor, how to treat their neighbor, that kind of thing. Um, all of these things were given in the Old Testament. Uh, and the Jew was commanded to live by the whole of the law. What did they do? Not only did they try to live by the whole of the law, they then created other commandments, other doctrines, other traditions, other rules and regulations, other do's and don'ts, uh, another system outside, outside of the ordinary system of the keeping of the Mosaic Code, the Law of Moses, outside of that ordinary system, they devised another system on top of that system, another religious system on top of that system, and they added all these extra rules and regulations, do's and don'ts, traditions, doctrines, commandments of men to help assist the people keep the law. In other words, they had to go through the system the, 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 the religious system of men first, they had to go through all the pharisaical or the priest commandments, the commandments of men. They had to go through all of these added rules and regulations by the Jews, by the Pharisees, by the priests, by the Jewish religious leadership. They had to first go through all the man-made rules and regulations added first to the law, before they could actually get to the actual keeping of the law, like Sabbath, for instance. I mean, there were so many, there were over 400 additional rules and regulations added to the ordinary one Sabbath keeping law on Saturday. Keep the Sabbath on Saturday. Rest, do no work. They added an additional 400 plus rules or regulations to that one commandment, keep the Sabbath. And that became such a heavy burden. It it became such a distraction, a diversion from the simple commandment to rest and worship God on that day. The seventh uh, or the seventh day, the fourth commandment, I believe it is, was for you and I to simply rest and worship God on that day. Do no labor, rest, worship God, and worship God together as a community. Come together and worship, worship God together. Rest the whole day. It's a set aside day just for that. Do no work, do no labor. Um, and then the Jews, before the people of God, the Old Testament people of God could just keep that simple rest and worship before God, they had no choice but to embrace and hold to uh, these other 438, I believe, 413, 400 plus rules and regulations added from the system of men, added to assist them to keep the one commandment. Now that is an overkill. And that are those things that are added to the law of Moses that Jesus meant through your tradition. Those things you're adding, you render powerless or make void the commandments in their lives. Um, that's the same principle here. Because of our many religious Christian systems and traditions, commandments, rules, doctrines of men, all the things that we add to the church, all the things that we add to believers that they had to believe, they have to believe and do, keep, obey the commandments of man, the things that the system we put in place to help them believe the gospel, to help them obey the gospel, to help them obey God is nothing but a huge distraction and a yoke of bondage upon ordinary Christians when all they've got to do is simply hear and believe the gospel. This is what Paul is saying in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Through the simple hearing of faith, so the, through the simple hearing of faith, the power moved, you got saved, your bodies were healed, you received the Holy Ghost, you got started in this new walk with Christ. You were born again, a new creation. Now the Spirit of God is in you. Now you can begin your journey in the Lord, your walk with Christ. And all you need is this same simple gospel, 
growing in your knowledge of everything the gospel has provided, its full meaning, its full, uh, its, its full provision, its full application in your life to grow in grace and knowledge. It's all you need. And the Holy Ghost is right there to empower your faith and to, uh, to bring to pass or to cause, to manifest in your life every promised result of the gospel when you believe. So the gospel is the knowledge of what you've received in Christ. The Holy Ghost is the power to bring that knowledge into harvest. So you got it. That's all you need. Now, let's go after Jesus. Let's go after the word of God. Let's go after an understanding of the gospel, what we've received, what it all means, how to walk it out, how to, how to be led of the Holy Ghost, how to yield to the sanctifying and perfecting work of the Spirit in our life, and how to, how to walk it, how to bear its fruit, how to harvest, how to receive that full provision, how to come into the abundant life. That's all we have to do. So we seek God every day. We go after his word. We, we may fast to press in. We may, uh, we may pray in the spirit, uh, using the ministry of tongues to edify our inner man, to build ourselves on our most holy faith. We may commune and worship and spend times being still and listening and, 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 and petitioning God, making supplication, uh, uh, spending time daily confessing his word, uh, being still meditating on his promise. Uh, we could be out there just doing the work of an evangelist, out there simply just uh, sharing the faith with others. Do you know that as you share the faith, your, the faith, your faith with others and you share the gospel with others, the Holy Ghost gives you more? So the more you pour out what you receive, the more the Holy Ghost pours in what you poured out. So it's powerful to go and do the work of an evangelist and pour out what you receive so God can pour in more. So you can pour out more. So you pour out what you have, God pours in more than what you had before, so you can pour in even more than you did before. It's powerful. So um, in simple obedience to the scriptures, uh, giving, uh, the importance of giving or tithing, the importance of giving to the ministry, to the work of the Lord, giving alms, ministering to the poor, um, just simply and, and, and walking out what you know in the word. Trusting God to show you how to do it by His Spirit. That's all you have to do. But to add to that a religious system to obey, other um, traditions of men, doctrines and commandments of men, a set of rules, do's and don'ts to help the believer, to help the Christian in the Christian faith, actually does more harm than good. And this is actually what Paul is dealing with here in, Galatia, in the epistle to the Galatians, he is dealing with those who believe the gospel is deficient by itself. The gospel is not enough by itself. They don't understand all that's in the gospel. They see the gospel only in some of its parts. They don't see the whole of the gospel, only some of its parts. They see the gospel as forgiveness of sins, yes. Some stop there. Others see the gospel as the forgiveness of sins and the impartation of new life. And they stop there. Others see the gospel as the forgiveness of sins, the impartation of new life, the promise of eternal life, and the resurrection, resurrection of the body, and stop there. And go no further, uh, which is their Christian justification. But then in their Christian sanctification, they set up religious systems and traditions, rules, regulations, doctrines, commandments of men. They set up do's and don'ts. They set up a moral code of conduct. They set up these things to help assist the believer in their sanctification and Christian growth when actually the Bible's very clear. The Bible calls it dead works and the Bible calls it you trying to finish or perfect in your flesh your own human effort, your own self-effort through your own doing, your own system, your own tradition, your own doctrine, your own works, what God has begun in the Spirit through the gospel. This is Galatians 3.3. 3. So it's very important that we see the gospel is more than just those things mentioned in our justification. The gospel, in addition to that, is a power power 
and provision for our Christian sanctification. Victory over sin, sickness and disease, poverty, death, the whole curse of the law. Victory over devils, demons. Victory over the elements, every circumstance, situation. God has provided victory in this gospel, a provision in this gospel in Christ, in his death, burial, resurrection, and you being put into Christ, death, burial, resurrection, and now you've put on Christ, you've put on his death, his burial, his resurrection. All that that, all that, that means, all that that has provided, you have it inside you, a treasure in the earthen vessel, and our entire sanctification, our entire uh, growth process, our entire walk from this moment all the way until Christ returns until we physically die and meet the Lord. Uh, our entire journey in this time called sanctification is you and I pressing into the full meaning and full reality and full provision of everything we already received in our simple baptism into Christ the moment we were born again. The moment we believed the gospel had our sins forgiven, had this new life imparted to us, we were put into Christ in his death, burial, resurrection, and Christ was put on us. His death became ours, his burial became ours, his resurrection became ours. His whole life and obedience and victory and faith and power and everything, every promise and benefit Everything that belongs to Christ as the heir of God was now given to us in our simple baptism into him. And through that simple baptism into Christ Jesus, we became heirs of God too because we're joined to the heir, joint heirs with Christ. We're joined to the heir. We're, we're joined to God as an heir because we're now joined to the heir. We are heirs of God because we are joined to the actual heir, which is Jesus Christ because we've been put into him uh, in a simple baptism through faith in the gospel. Now, this has brought us into a new creation, a new existence, a new world, a new life, uh, a new reality in Christ. It's all in Christ. That's why we're pressing into Christ, because Christ holds it in him, and he's in us. So we're looking to work out our salvation. The salvation that was already deposited into us through faith in this gospel, through continually growing in this grace of the gospel and in this knowledge of the gospel where the Holy Spirit manifests his power in a powerful uh, manifested promise result of everything the gospel has provided through Christ Jesus. See, this is all it is. Um, to add anything to that, to add any religious system, tradition of men to add anything today uh, can take away from it, can distract or divert our attention away from these simple facts of our simple baptism in Christ and the full meaning and full provision of this gospel in Christ in us. And what that means for us, what that has provided for us, and the fruit it can bear in and through our life and the works it can work through our hands if we just believe. Now, let me go ahead and close out this first video. I'm going, I'm going to come back and do a second video uh, to this, uh, add to this, um, so we can finish the background or backdrop to Galatians uh, 5, 16 to 25. Now, again, it says, Paul says, stand fast, hold your ground against these Judaizers or against those who would add to the gospel, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty or freedom wherewith Christ hath made us free. Um, stand fast on the liberty and freedom you receive through faith in this gospel. A new birth, a new creation. Um, then he says, and be not entangled again. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, Paul speaks of the yoke of bondage here. This yoke of bondage here, um, historically speaking, this yoke of bondage here is referring to the false gospel of legalism. Historically, the historical setting here in the text, this yoke of bondage is speaking specifically to those who, add, who tried to add Moses to the gospel, 
or those who try to mingle the law of Moses with the grace of Christ. And he says, they came into a yoke of bondage. The yoke of bondage means to come under an obligation to obey. So these Galatian believers, because they turned from simple faith in the gospel, turned from the simple baptism into Christ, the new creation, because they turned from that and began to turn from that and begin to look to those things being added by these Judaizers, Moses and the law, Paul was saying they came into a yoke of bondage. They came under a new obligation to obey. They came under a new obligation, a new yoke, a new obligation to obey something else. No longer the gospel, but now those things being added, Moses and the law being added by the Judaizers. Now, this is the historical context of this epistle. But today, in our everyday, present, practical Christian experience of Christendom, being in a world of 2.3 billion Christians, being in a world of Roman Catholicism, a, a world of the Orthodox faith, a world of Protestantism, uh, around all these Christian religious traditions and systems of men, all these added rules or do's and don'ts, the religious box that we put people in to help them. Now, I understand that many well-meaning men and women, well-meaning persons, have created these systems, these, uh, this mediumship, this mediation. Many of these religious systems and traditions of men, these rules, do's and don'ts, become a, uh, become a mediation between us and the gospel. So now to get to the gospel, if we're going to reach the gospel, we have to go through being a Baptist or being a Catholic, go through the sacraments, or go through um, uh, other Protestant religious systems. See, we, we've created these religious boxes and put people in them, and now we expect them to work within those boxes and through those boxes as a mediation between themselves and the gospel or Christ. And now we have to get to Christ and get to the gospel through these boxes or through this things being added, this additional mediation. How many understand that? Paul called that a yoke of bondage, a new thing that we're now obligated to obey. And that new thing we're now obligated to obey simply distracts us from the simple obligation to believe the gospel and obey. That's it. The simple hearing of faith and believing the gospel, receiving and uh, bearing its fruit. That's all it is. And so I just wanted to do a quick recap on that as a reminder not to tear down any man's religious system or tradition. I love all my Christian brothers and sisters of all different persuasions and walks of life and background traditions, different settings, different parts of the world. I love them all. And I'm just trying to remind you what we all have in common is the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, the simplicity of Christ in this gospel, in our simple baptism uh, into his death, burial, resurrection. Now, again, I just want to do a quick reminder that uh, check the three books out, Evangel, Redemption in Christ, uh, Evangel, Believer Sanctification, and Evangel, Justification by Faith. Uh, you can get them on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kindle. Look under my name, Curtis L. Schultz, C-U-R-T-I-S, L, last name S-C-H-U-L-Z-E. Uh, when you get the books, in the back of the book, there's an email. If in reading these books, you have any questions, comments, uh, you can shoot me an email or and leave your number there if you have a very difficult question and I'll either text you back or email you back with the answer or call you if I think that's more appropriate. God bless, love you, and, um, and, and I love you. Just go and be powerful in this gospel. God bless.